The Goal Goal 13 games, top secret episode in the Mathic Conspiracy, both for the NES, based on Zakao Saito's manga of the same name, by Vic Takai, with the latter being developed on their behalf by the ill-fated icon A.K. Yuma Kobo, circa 1988 and 1990 respectively. sequence said it all. Either way, before we proceed any further, I'd like to acknowledge the following. Brooklyn Interactive Group, Somerville Media Center, Ian Ferguson from 16-Bit Heroes, hailing from Merrimack as always, Blast Processing Video Games, Matt Lister from Dover, New Hampshire, The Stones, Matt and Sarah from Ridge, New Hampshire, Bitbar Salem, Replayed Austin, I'm looking at you especially Brittany and McLean, Matt Ezra, aka Cygnus Destroyer 20 X, Pat Contry, the NES Punk, Abed Eric Perez, and Aaron Hickman, aka Daya, both from San Antonio, Texas, Brain Scratch Commentaries, Mario B and Nicole, Darman Studios, we're not just telling stories, we're changing lives, Jay Shetty, Lauren Pespisa, Kenzie Bach, James Rowe from Cinemassacre, Mike Matei, Shane Lewis from Reras, Gabriel J. to Betancourt, alias Riley Scott 100 from Fitchburg, Michael Dennis from Canhead Pictures, and finally, Rod Weber of Dumpster Fire 2020 fame. Anyhow, with these out of our system, if you've read any of the original Global 13 manga volumes, or saw any miscellaneous media adapted from it, most notably The Professional and Queen Bee, despite the latter not being released until a decade later, the premise should be second nature, and God help me if I need someone who hasn't. You're putting control of the titular assassin, or spy according to Nintendo and Victicai's censorship parameters, real name Duke Togo, on a mission to confront and turn the tables on a mysterious terrorist faction, who not only framed Togo, aka G13, for sniping a helicopter in motion over the skyline of the old Big Apple, obviously New York, but actually committing said murder, in tandem with the theft of both a vaccine and the plans for the CIA's secretly developed weapon, the Cassandra G, from amongst its wreckage fragments. Despite the CIA's far-fetched as fuck conclusion that Gogo 13 was behind all this chaos, according to another secret international organization, Fixer, it was in fact not him, but that aforementioned mysterious terrorist group, whose name I'm keeping clandestine for the time being, and for the sake of avoiding any spoilers of course, a representative transmitting said report disappears, and an operative acting under the codename of Condor is dispatched to East Berlin, Germany to gather more intelligence. Nevertheless, Goldblow 13 intends to carry on Condor's objective, while at the same time, making those goddamn terrorist faction fuckbaits his bitches once and for all. In terms of the main gameplay concept, what could one expect but another side-scrolling, espionage-style action-adventure platformer, almost reminiscent of Namco Bandai's Rolling Thunder, one might suspect, but with a plethora of twists unlike anything anyone's ever imagined, no less. Upon commencement, a cutscene plays out involving our main assassin, Oregon Spy, visiting Germany, precisely East Berlin, where he comes face to face with the first of many supporting characters, Maria Lovelet, from the aforementioned Fixer. She informs him of the prior incidents that took place during the intro, as well as how great the chances are that Condor will get his ass eliminated by the KGB thanks entirely to the info he accumulated about the vaccine and its whereabouts, no pun intended. Not to mention the report he transmitted to Fixer, and this is where her first mission comes in. Following the briefing, the real encounters commence. You're strolling within the streets of East Berlin, and the surroundings of numerous other countries later on, confronting and dispatching every KGB assassin and or miscellaneous adversary in your way. Control setup-wise, your D-pad forces the big G-13 to haul ass wherever and duck whenever possible, while BNA allow him to jump and attack individually. Regarding the latter command, by the way, while you start off jump kicking regardless of your height, you do gain ammo for your gun, and I strongly, strongly suggest conserving some for every eventual skirmish. Drop dead fuck bait. Sit and spin, dick face. Go fuck a goddamn washing machine, chicken shit. Yeah, you got moves, so do I, cunt rag. In true Metroid and Gunstar Heroes fashion, there's a life counter at the top left, indicated in the form of numbers. Ditto for your gun ammo, but more on that later. Occasionally, you'll be sucked into FPS-style shootouts, where you're forced to vanquish the shit-slurping demon-fucking-Christ out of those very same assassins, and even attack choppers on land and in air, not to mention stealth bombers, scuba divers underwater, and attack subs much later, which for the record, are mandatory and inescapable beyond belief. 
Should you endure too much damage, it's curtains for all G13, at which point you're free to continue precisely where you left off. But you can only do so 52 times, after which it's back to square fucking one. Shifting our focus into the itinerary, as mentioned before, you're in East Berlin attempting to reach Condor before the KGB does, while keeping the latter outfit at bay on both land and in air via an attack helicopter, in between which you not only target and assassinate one of two possible snipers, Hoster on the Brandenburg TV tower with your custom M16, whose controls involve adjusting its view via the D-pad, and finally zooming into your desired target before landing a direct hit by a BNA individually. <laughs> Gather more intel from other supporting characters, for instance, Dark Bullet at Friedrich Street Station, and later the Purple Lady informants at the Green Mansion, and the very same agent's Condor, who, get this, ends up being murdered while spilling the beans. And eventually meet up and fornicate with another Fixer agent, Cherry Grace, hence the first of two moments where G13 gets laid. I mean, seriously, sex in an NES game? Granted, there's no nudity here compared to its original Japanese counterpart, Twilight of the Gods. But then again, who gives a shit? After which you're infiltrating an undersea base near the Spree River, in and out of scuba gear, during which the first of several mind-numbing, if at times turkey-talking, 3D mazes is introduced, akin to Goonies 2, Fester's Quest, Contra and Fantasy Star no less, littered with armed guards and hazards galore, with the latter including trap doors, laser gates, and often respawning walls that can be passed through by chucking a grenade at them, three of which you're allowed to carry before restocking again upon dispatching a guard, not to mention two random-ass boss skirmishes, one against the dark-skinned Greek hitman, Spartacus, and another against your doppelganger, hence Twin Gogol 13. Unless you're familiar with each and every layout, prepare to get lost very goddamn quick and often. Other countries you'll be investigating throughout these suspensive views capers include Athens, Greece, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, the Amazon, and finally Antarctica, specifically Alexander Island near the South Pole, the latter two of where our main enemy bases are headquartered. And believe you me, you'll either have an inconsiderably frictionless time enduring each mission, as long as you're aware enough to keep your eyes peeled for everything in your way without any wet works from the opposition, or one turned out to be searing and problematic, not to mention cumbersome as fuck! Expect the latter to occur more often should you happen to slip up at any given juncture. Of course, more plot points are revealed throughout each chapter, depending on your first drink survival tactics and instincts. While many find the controls to be baffling and awkward at first, they're at the very least responsive. In fact, more responsive than any half-assed discount Universal remote and or Toy RC remote no less. Specifically the varied height jumps and knowing when to execute them, not just busting caps or lobbing grenades at will in every other perspective specific area, and as overwhelming and repetitive as the gameplay aspect is, in clear as their reality, they're anything goddamn but. Definitely not gonna fucking lie here. In regards to Goldville 13's challenge, I don't even need to advise everyone to expect an astronomical ass ton of perils that await our professional, world-class assassin slash spy for hire, outdoing even the likes of Vector Man, Tomb Raider, and The Last of Us combined. The what we're dealing with isn't anywhere within the latter's league. Case in point, the multifaceted encounters you spiral yourself into involve the usual shoot first, ask questions later spiel, mostly in terms of making every adversary your internal bitches before they do vice versa. Also, remember that secret terrorist group slash faction I made a brief mention of earlier? Specifically the Drake Empire? Initially, they were known as the goddamn Nazis in the original Japanese version, involved in a fucked up conspiracy to bring themselves back into power, hence why Fixer's been investigating the corrupt actions of those insidious bastards, who alongside the KGB, obviously, will stop a dick all in furthering their ultimate aim. But I digress. Bottom line, no matter what situation you're in, you really have to bring your top shelf A game, especially during those nauseating as shit maze areas, about which I suggest referring back, including the first person shooter confrontations with the aforementioned Spartacus and Twin Gold of 13. And don't even get me started, goddammit, with the health max and cigarettes found in Athens after exploring and kicking ass throughout each and secret area, no less, which are mandatory for the remainder of the game, by the way. Dinner for when G13 gets laid twice, not just with the aforementioned Cherry Grace in East Berlin, but also even Athens.
Did I somehow also forget to mention that there was even a final confrontation within the Jerk Empire's Antarctic stronghold against a massive supercomputer run by a single living brain and its army of Hitler-like human clones? You're given a fair, if mentally and physically draining, time limit, predating even that infamous underwater bomb defusing mission near the Hudson River Dam in the first TMNT, to annihilate the shit out of the latter indicated army, made up of numerous phases, followed by the moving cannons, and lastly, snipe and said brain to absolute extinction, thus ending this chaotic ass conflict. No rhyme intended on this one, but fuck it all up, however! You'll never guess what the Christ will happen thereafter! Oh, and I'd once again refer back, if I were you, to that 52 continuous stipulation I also recounted, since, like, it's not god-shitting damn obvious already. There's no way up Sheila Bravlovsky's fat you ass, I'm recapping it all. Now, not to jump the motherfucking gun here on the graphics, no pun intended, but they're a mixed bag in every sense of the word. The participating backgrounds, whether in-game or during the face-to-face -face conversation cutscenes, at least have a primitive yet ambitious deal of variety and detail, from the urban backdrops of East Berlin and Rio de Janeiro, the historic and grand landscapes of Athens, Greece, complete with the differentiating underwater scenes and interior structures of various buildings, stations, fortresses, what fucking have us, to the gritty, anarchic, and ragtag Amazon and South Pole landscapes. In addition, the character designs of not only our main professional assassin slash spy during the cutscenes, but also the assortment of characters he interacts with, be it ally or adversary, are more than decent, and somehow resemble their source material counterparts. However, the big G13's in-game appearance is bland looking, likewise for the numerous assortments of adversaries and occasional allies he goes up against. Though not as horrendous as those blocky ass, repetitious ass, 3D maze interior scenes, which of course are more than enough to look the other mother goddamn fucking lock shitting cum flinging way. The blood sprays whenever the enemy sniper gets his ass wasted, ditto for the guards in the mazes, those earlier sighted yet non existent here, hints of nudity in the Japan only Famicom counterpart when he gets laid, and even depictions of the infamous swastika, the most notable of which being when you discover a clue later on in the game. Talk about controversial, am I right? Music and sound-wise, orchestrated by Michiharu Hasuya, and for more details on him, refer to both by Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and Clash of Demon Head reviews, numbers 55 and 24 individually. The contrasting selection of themes are also in mixed bag territory. The title theme, also heard when paused, as well as during the auto-scrolling helicopter shmup scenes, minus any accompanying percussion whatsoever, doesn't disappoint, and nor do a few other exceptional choices, namely the side-scrolling urban areas, the undersea base interiors, the themes of East Berlin, Spartacus and Smirk, and even when G13 meets up and fornicates with Eve before her eventual dirt nap, not only possessing something of a 007 vibe, but more than anything, appropriately setting the tones for their individual moments. While everything else also meets the same goal, they'll somehow drone over you in a much shorter time period than an intense blindfolded snowboarding race down K2 with Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow from G.I. Joe and the Lake Gustav Holst Mars combined, despite being far from grading. The variety of sound effects, as primitive and out of place as they may be, likewise for their quality, are at the very least true to life. The gunfire, chopper odors, explosions and jet engines. Like how the Christ can anyone fucking go wrong here? Replayability-wise, notwithstanding the plethora of common pet peeves many have discovered with this game, a few involving the varying crosshair speeds during the pan-and-scan rail shooters slash FPS confrontations on land, in air, and sea, with the latter featuring the slowest speed in comparison to the others, the lack of variety in environmental scenery, with some exceptions, and enemy lineups, be it human, creature, vehicle, or WMD, those infamous as fuck 3D mazes which only the most dedicated masochist can breeze through without a motherfucking map, and even the lack of a battery-based save-in or password feature given the game's length, the obvious pros outweigh the shit out of them by twice the magnitude of a goddamn mudslide, including but not limited to the always beguiling plotline and or the alternating paths one might add. Either way, if you're a massive manganame and or spy fan, or if you've got a trigger-happy aura writhing within yourself that's been struggling to escape time and time again, you'd be off your goddamn Roger Sleeve top secret episode out in the blistering ass cold. Exhibit B, the aforementioned Mavic Conspiracy.
continuing from where Top Secret episode left off, the world's on the brink of nuclear destruction thanks entirely to a weapon satellite being shanghaied out of orbit by none other than the Mathit Revolutionary Group. A cadre of terrorists hellbent on making the US and Soviet government satellites fall from the cold reaches of space, thereby extorting them in the process. And to top it off, the terrorists are demanding that the Soviets must turn over their EM wave research and that the Americans should do the same with their nuclear battleship, the Los Angeles, over to them. Because of all this insanity, both the CIA and KGB are at war with each other, and Gogo 13, back on the fucking scene again, is charged with another fucking mission to confront and eradicate the entire Mafid group and their sadistic ass leader, neutralize the satellite capture system, and rescue its sole inventor, Dr. Barrows, who after mysteriously disappearing from his lab in the UK, has been somehow confined to Paris. Once more, in terms of gameplay, everything's ditto just like last time, well, almost everything. But with, isn't it obvious, a handful of features and adjustments applied just for this sequel alone. As ever, a cutscene is introduced, a la Ninja Gaiden, involving a new supporting character informing our returning assassin slash spy for hire about his latest assignment, namely CIA informant slash supplier James. Which by this point, I suggest referring back to the plotline statement about, with many more yet to follow, and the majority of what's to be revealed as it unfolds. The first two to three areas of Paris involve making every opposing assassin your bitch, some unarmed and others with guns, knives, and occasionally grenades along the way, both with old-fashioned martial arts and fisticuffs, and with a newly acquired weapon provided by James, namely the Colt Python Revolver, its maximum being 30 bullets for the first three acts, after which you're provided another gun much lighter by another CIA member and G13's eventual romantic interest, Sylvia, namely a Smith & Wesson M56, whose own max is twice that of the former, precisely 60. Basic fucking math for Folks, during which are not only timed here, likewise for the other side scrolling areas, as well as the 3D mazes I'll get to in a moment, which you have to escape. The control setup's about the same, except the jump and attack controls are reversed, specifically A and B this time, like every other basic ass platformer during the NES and Game Boy eras, no less. Oh, and you can also perform higher leaps via up and A simultaneously. Endure way too much damage, hence your standard meter above this time around. Likewise, in a few of the other multifaceted gameplay scenes, depending on their hierarchy, you're given 27 continues upon death this time around, a little more than half of what was provided last time in comparison, I might add. Following the third side scrolling area is the return of those often minded, nerve raping 3D mazes, with those same armed assassins, crates with extra ammo and health upon their defeats, sliding doors accessible via A, leading to other halls and sections, and stairs leading to higher floors, like every other building in real life, no less. Many of which will drive your ass straight to purgatory and beyond with a one way ticket back to Hellview Population 96. Except for one cakewalkish as fuck maze with shit all but just the goddamn crate of ammo and a random adversary. That is, in case you have to reload. There's even driving scenes akin to Square Enix's Rad Racer 1 and 2, Knight Rider by Acclaim and Pack and Video, Konami's Bayou Billy, and Atari's Road Blasters, starting with the second half of Act 2, within which you're keeping the KGB and Mafid Group's corrupt asses at bay in G13's Ferrari, unleashing grenades via B and accelerating its engine via A, while avoiding all hazardous occurrences, for instance explosions, enemy fire, collisions, you name it, by shifting gears whenever necessary, either up or down on the D-pad, as well as another event later on, not to mention boss confrontations in the form of standard hand-to-hand hand combat against a date east karate champ and irem's kung fu where you use up on the d-pad to jump and being able to punch and kick singularly and even one shot sniping opportunities like in the previous installment not to mention kemko and infogram's rescue the embassy mission where you adjust the site via the d-pad obviously and land a shot via a while taking into consideration the wind speed and direction which is about as random as goddamn speed dating but i'll get back to the latter two eventually <laughs> Other side scrolling areas include a river in Venice, Italy, or Venezia, if you will, above which jump timing is crucial between the land and bridge gaps you traverse over. Ditto for wasting random adversaries that appear on the opposite side before proceeding to the Champs Elysees, atop the constantly moving Orient Express, converging towards Kabul, Afghanistan, inhabited by shotgun toting killers. Shit, Jewel of the Nile and Last Crusade much? In the scorching Afghan desert with pits, side armed assassins, scorpions. Shit, no, for fuck's sake, not that scorpion. Monkey men, attackers with boomerangs, followed by a desolate cave with attack dogs and an underground high-tech facility with more of the same opposing armed assassins, even introducing those with shields no less, and mechanical defense systems that can be destroyed after evading its targeting sensor lights. 
In terms of all the end bosses and targets you'll either face off against or snipe out of sight. The former features two armored clad barbarians with swords, the first being the arm of Maffet at the end of Act 1, Ahmad Khan, an international Afghan terrorist and central figure in the Maffet group who makes Omar from the aforementioned Jewel of the Nile look like Ned fucking Flanders, and finally Canine, hence that other armored clad sword toting barbarian I mentioned. All of whom, holy snakeoid shit, turn out to be complete motherfucking pushovers as long as, yet again, you're aware enough of how to handle yourself against them. Regarding the latter, there's the helicopter pilot during the second half of Act 2, and even unexpected turncoats Dr. Barrows and James near the end, following the defeat of K-9, with the latter taking place following your second and final driving scene pursuing his deceptive ass before boarding the plane to Istanbul. In comparison to the previous offering, the Mavic Conspiracy shows absolutely no mercy, nor provides any fair shakes or breaks whatsoever, so why fucking expect the opposite? At least the controls are the same as before, yet as one could expect out of this often polarized follow-up, Slightly augmented, notwithstanding how often a slight mishap is bound to occur. For instance, evasion timing while confronting the opposition in the side-scrolling areas, or attempting to execute a direct hit on your target during the long-distance one-shot sniping opportunity scenes in dubious relation to the wind's attributes, resulting in A, being exposed to way too much physical damage, or B, the aforementioned deliberate epic fail misses, respectively. And to top it all off, how can anyone in their right mind bitch about the tried-and-true yet always welcome brand spanking new gameplay advancements, right? Challenging difficulty-wise, feel free to refer back to the exact same subject I discussed regarding Top Secret Episode, as it all applies here. Despite how often this game will tear out all of your major arteries, throw them all in the goddamn blender, and hit fucking frappe, there's still no excuse not to grasp all its rudimentary ins and outs, like those often soul-trenching 3D mazes, a few of which also involve backtracking to escape under the strictest time limits, outshining the likes of every Special Olympics event and every game show competition rolled into one, the precise jump timing in between the river gaps in Venice, and atop the Orient Express to Kabul and elsewhere, and the less I say about the driving confrontations against those goddamn KGB cockstains under the command of their bastard chief Gerbich, as well as Turncoat James, let alone the one-shot, long-distance sniping opportunities against the enemy helicopter pilot, presumably the aforementioned Gerbich, Dr. Barrows, and the earlier recounted James, the batter. Speaking of the latter two, by the way, Dr. Barrows, the hostage inventor that the Maffet's been keeping out of sight the whole time, whom you are trying to save, is actually the sadistic-ass leader of said faction as retaliation towards those who tried to take the piss out of him for his research, thereby not only sending both the US and Soviet Union in the most unexpected uproar in history, but also taking the CIA and KGB, hence their respective agencies, with the latter being launched as dissolved for nearly three decades in real life, no less, along with them. And James, the once reliable CIA informant slash supplier, ends up massacring the bejesus out of Sylvia, not only for the sake of protecting his own identity, but mainly as a sign of his defection to the KGB on his way to the Istanbul airport, hence that entire turncoat angle I noted earlier, serving as a valid incentive for G13 to pursue and rub those deceptive as balls, pissants, sons of bitches, the motherfucking Christ out. Anyways, our remaining climax standpoints aside, please refer to that 27 continuous stipulation I also noted, as well as the hints given for a top secret episode, which for the last goddamn time, apply here as well. What better way to sum up the graphics than a drastic yet well-deserved upscaling from its prequel, starting with the much grittier cutscenes, inspired by the likes of Tecmo's Ninja Gaiden franchise, detailing every plot point from start to finish, even without any visuals no less. The in-game backgrounds have much more pizzazz in style, from the breathtaking historic exteriors of Paris and Italy, to the ominous gung-ho scenes atop the Orient Express, from Italy to Kabul, the destitute Afghan desert, caves, and its advanced underground high-tech facility, likewise for the two driving scenes, and the three long-distance sniping opportunities, despite only featuring our main spy taking aim at the bottom, along with the necessary field details. I don't even need to mention how much of an irreversible eyesore the 3D maze scenes provide either, so let's not even fucking go there. Regarding the depictions of not only G13 himself, directly rendered from the manga as expected, but also the characters he interacts with during the cutscenes, James, Sylvia, Gerbich, the Hotel Messenger, Ahmad Khan, Dr. Barrows, and others, they all run the gamut from inviting yet rugged to just flat out, and not to be too goddamn simplistic here, but why not make the exception here, what the Christ? Fucking meh. 
Concerning G13's in-game portrayal, at least he's a trifle more distinguished and refined here, as well as most of those unrelenting, turret-chomping, KGB and Mavic terrorist rectal warts, and the new end bosses and targets he confronts. In terms of music and sound, composed this time around by Toshiko Tasaki, also acting under the alias of Selene, or Serinu, of Jalco's of Steinex and Totally Rad, Whippers and Ecab Attack, also for Victor Kai, Kadash and Saint Sword for Taito, and even Heaven's Gate and Persona 2 fame, the latter for Atlas. While the new themes don't have much to offer, apart from the always iconic opening theme, let me just go on record by stating the antithesis that there's a mix of various vibes revealed within them, whose top 5 fans I'll provide like so, and I'd watch very, very closely if I were you. Also, no sophomoric understatement intended, the all these realistic sound effects could have used a scotch more tweaking, but, and once again, not gonna lie here, there's no disputes whatsoever on my end. Replayability-wise, even at this point, considering how many prefer the original to this, why even deny the fact that the Mavic Conspiracy has way more to offer versus even that? In addition, given the game's slightly shorter length, it should be obvious that every opportunity to get the hang of all the red-ass-worthy tests of patience, confidence, and agility is much more worth hungering for than, say, the embrace of your one true love and then some. Which, in all honesty, and forgive the self-lamentation, not only have I been shying away from for so long, I have no motherfucking life because of that, amongst countless other indignities. But once again, I digress. Either way, consider yourself a colossal jackass to pass up the Mavic Conspiracy any longer. Therefore, what's my final verdict? There are absolutely no words, no goddamn words, to illustrate how much I recommend both Golgo 13 titles, in spite of the continuous myriad of common complaints expressed about them time after time, which I'm better off dismissing at this juncture, with the obvious exception of the insufferable anarchy they'll bestow upon you a millionfold. Thanks to their intricate premises and unexpected thematic adult elements, despite the latter lacking way more of both than the former, they're nonetheless a surefire, sensational slew of bitchin' exploits, and you owe it to yourself to try out both Top Secret Episode and The Mafia Conspiracy, even if you've never read or seen any other media related to Google 13, as they're both fairly cheap, running us between 4 to 92 bucks and between 7 to 66 bucks respectively. Also, I strongly suggest scoping out the two anime films, The Professional and Queen Bee, however possible, or avoid the latter, your choice. Not to mention the live-action films with the late Ken Takakura, Pre-Black Rain and Mr. Baseball, and Sonny Chiba, now JJ Sonny Chiba, of Toy Street Fighter and the Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift fame. Trust me, you won't regret them in the slightest. Until then, folks, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro Guy triumphantly signing off.